Let me zoom in. Uh, okay. Hi. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about mythology. One of the things that you will see is I use mythology and symbol a lot in my exercise coaching program, in my theoretic model, in my practice. What is the purpose of mythology? Mythology is so fascinating. It's a bunch of stories. A lot of the traditions, like in, in the Indian culture, the Hindu, uh, in, the Veda, in the Vedas, were passed down orally for years and years and years before they were ever written down. So we find this when we're talking about lost languages. A lot of these um, native tribes have sort of lost language because things weren't written. And now we're trying to sort of salvage the information. So all of these sort of stories that were passed down orally have become a pool called the collective unconscious. Every single one of us has access to this collective unconscious. So when we see the symbol for Mars or Venus or male or female, we actually energetically connect to these symbols. When we hear the story of Aladdin or Cinderella, those are rooted in myths. Disney, all, was, all he did was take a myth from certain cultures and sort of put new, um, new names and new costumes and sort of repackage them into the Disney films. And every movie in Hollywood, every Disney film, if you boil it down to key myths, you're gonna find the sort of key myths that are found in every tradition. This is why astrologically, no matter which sort of astrological system you buy into or what constellation, all of the ancient philosophies and traditions have seen the lion, have seen the fish. It's not that there's lion and fish in the sky, but they did is they got the information from this collective unconscious. So these stories play a huge role in our psyche. And I am a lover of myth and a lover of symbol. Because if we understand the story that we're living, we can rewrite the story. Because really, we're just picking a story out of a hat. And one of the things I tell clients all the time is, what's your favorite fairy tale? If you have a favorite fairy tale, you will usually identify with the villain as aspects in your bad bucket, and you can also identify with the protagonist as items in your good bucket. So kind of try that out. So we'll talk a lot about myth and symbol, but today I wanna to focus on one of the important myths. And you see that I have two triangles. So this is the mother-father-child triad, and it is the replica from a myth that's called Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. Okay, so it's a Greek myth. We're gonna go through it. I also have Nietzsche's three stages of metamorphosis on the board. So no matter who you like to read, no matter what philosophy or religion or tradition you buy into, these myths, these concepts are ingrained in all of us. So we just change the costume and the tradition and the culture and the space of the world in which the, the, the tradition is, is told. But really we all have these beliefs inside of us and we're tapping into this and living out that story in our life at any given time. What happens in the mother-father tri child triad? Our parents birth us, and the child is continuously responding to the parents. Any person, place, thing, or situation, automatically the child shows up. We have to consciously choose to show up differently as an adult. So what impact does this have mythologically? There is a beautiful myth that is Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. This myth is um, Demeter was the Mother Earth so to speak. She was the, the, the goddess of harvest, and Persephone was her daughter. They spent all day frolicking in the woods with their little basket. In their basket, they would go and they would pick Narcissus flowers. And the mother would give Persephone the Narcissus flowers to smell, and they would kind of intoxicate her, like sort of in drug-induced state. Why did the mother need to create a drug-induced state, so to speak, for the daughter, so that the daughter will never leave? It is the same concept of why we keep showing up as the child in our life. So that the little bit of love or the drug-induced state, the snow globe, continues and perpetuates. Therefore, we get our version of love, we stay part of a family system, we're loyal to this thing, and we have an identity on the earth. That's the basis. So Demeter and Persephone, mother-daughter, very happy, frolicking day by day, sniffing the Narcissus flowers, and all of a sudden, 
the rape. Hades. Hades is God of the underworld. He has to do with our bad bucket. He has to do with our demons. He has to do with the process of death before there is a rebirth, which is what this is. We're birthing our child selves into our adult selves. It's painful. If you've ever had a baby, childbirth is painful. Same concept with this myth. So Demeter and Persephone, happy, Hades sitting in the underworld, miserable as he is. And he's bored. And he's like, eh, let me see what havoc I can wreck today. And he rips open the earth and he rapes Persephone from her mother. He just rips her, he takes her from her. He takes her to the underworld, he rapes her, and before she is able to decide, he gives her six pomegranate seeds to eat. Because there is a rule in the underworld that if you eat something while you're down there, you are basically being welcomed and you're inviting, uh, you're, being, uh, you're accepting the invitation, so it's a sort of way to lock you in and now she becomes Hades' wife. Well, needless to say, Demeter is destroyed. She stops producing all vegetation, and the earth's people start to die. So Zeus, Hades' brother, goes down to the underworld and says, Hades, you need to fix this. The people are dying. Hades doesn't care. But Zeus is smart. And Zeus says, if people die, your underworld is going to be overly populated, and you don't like that. So he's like, you're right. So he strikes a deal with Zeus. He's like, since Persephone ate six pomegranate seeds, she is my wife for six months out of the year. But I'll give her back to her mother six, the other six months. So it is believed that spring and summer are when Persephone and Demeter are reunited and the birds are chirping and the flowers are blooming. Whereas fall and winter is when Persephone is down with her husband and Mother Earth is sad and fails to produce any harvest. So this is sort of the mythological explanation of the seasons. Now, what does this mean in terms of our psyche? What is this rape? In psychology, in subconscious processing, from the moment of conception until we're seven years old, we are in data gathering or information gathering. This is how we're populating our good and bad buckets. Really, it's already done at conception. The rest of the time is just confirmation, 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 so that we have a story to tell. By seven, ego development, personality development is believed to sort of have been crystallized and the child now sort of has all the information that he or she is going to need for the rest of their life. So what happens is that rape must happen. Something must rip you from your parents. Sometimes it is abuse as a child, unfortunately. Sometimes it's a parent committing suicide. Sometimes it's simply going into childhood uh, preschool. That now you've left mom and dad safety and now you're in this classroom with 20 other kids and you're a nobody. We all have this rape. What is the importance of the rape? It is the permission that we are given, giving ourselves to live as the adult or the individual or separate from the umbilical cord. And every single one of us has it. There are times that we actually create, I have a client who actually created an actual rape situation in her life, she lived this myth out to a T, so that she could get away from her overly enmeshed mother because she didn't have any other mechanism to create that space. A lot of my clients move to Australia, to New Zealand, to, to, to Canada, to be physically far away from their parents. Because in our psyche, we are always enmeshed, we're always with the narcissist flowers, we're always under a spell from our parents because of that moment of conception and fulfilling a need. So all of us have a Hades in our life. Now, where does this sort of correlate with Nietzsche's three stages of metamorphosis? Nietzsche states that first we have a camel, we're a camel, then we turn into a lion, and then what he calls we turn into a child. So he's using sort of the animal analogy into a human analogy which is really the whole focus of turning our animal nature into our human nature. It's a different way of saying the same thing. 
He says that when we're younger, psychologically, of course, the camel carries the burdens. This is us carrying the burden of the family lineage, the ancestral stories, the needs of our parents. Some people, unfortunately, die and never become, in his model, the child, or in mine, the adult, or the divine child. Then he says that the lion, the lion in this case is the rape, where we have a will, where we say we're going to defeat the beast. One of the most famous Herculean myths is when he fights the Nemean lion. The concept of the lion is we're going to go face to face with the beast, we're going to rip off its skins, and now we become the king of the jungle of our own life in our subconscious. And then from the lion, the I will, which is very ego-based, which is necessary, that's the whole purpose of the teenage, then he says we turn into the child. So he's referring here to from animal to human. And he says this is when we kill the thou shalt. The thou shalt relates to the rules, the rules that our parents gave us and the purpose of step number six, which is to write our own rule book so we can live by our own rules. So these three parallel each other because this is a theme that's commonly found in mythology and literature and philosophy. So the model of mother, father, child is simply replicating this. In another video, we're going to talk a lot about being the victim or what I call the prince or the pauper or the god shit complex. You'll see I use these sort of zero to 100 sort of examples like prince, pauper, and then our goal in becoming the adult is finding the 48 to 52. So I just want to quickly mention the victim and mention over and over how the whole purpose of this model, the whole purpose of getting raped, the whole purpose of becoming the child in Nietzsche's model is to take our power back so that we can live by our rules, not those that were given to us, whether it was judgments or value systems. So I love this model because in any situation, and this relates to step number two, Step number two in the model is what don't I like about this person, place, thing, or situation. That is where we look at our judgments. If we have a judgment about something, we can go to our bad bucket and find it in there or continue populating the bad bucket. The thing I love about this model is you are never a victim in any situation. You are either a Demeter, a Persephone, or a Hades. So think about a situation in your life where something was taken from you. You're a Demeter. Think about a situation in your life when you took something from someone, you're a Hades. And if you use these sort of concepts, then you can understand that everything is always sort of fair. You're going to be a Demeter sometimes, a Persephone sometimes when you're taken from something, and sometimes a Hades where you take. So these are concepts so you can start understanding that you're not a victim, that you are in control of your life, and that... You will take as much as be taken from, but it's always to serve a purpose in your psyche. And if you can understand what role you're playing to meet what story, what myth, then you can understand what you're doing in your life and then a result, the end of the story and rewrite it. Thank you.